seated. <clears throat> the Ten Commandments are given to the Hebrew people, setting the groundwork for all of the law and the guidance that follows. These uh, ten words, these ten commandments, have been revered for century. They have been cut into stone countless times. They've even had a pretty impressive movie made about them, uh, as Charlton Heston did a great job. But let us not for a second believe that they have always been follow, followed assiduously. The last commandment we looked at, do not kill, with the implied take care of your neighbors. There have been plenty of people who have been killed over the centuries, many of them by Christians. There are plenty of killing that happens in the Old Testament. Right? The same can be said of all of the other commandments. If you look, you don't have to look too far for examples of them being broken. Looking at adultery and the flip of that, the protection of marriage, which is the hope, that every commandment has two sides, do this and don't do that. Looking at thou shalt not commit adultery and you shall protect marriage, well, if you look in Scripture, you don't have to look too far to find both being broken, right? Adultery, King David and Bathsheba, and then his son and his daughter. David's family gets very weird very quickly. And you look at uh, marriage, how, how is marriage treated? On the front of your bulletin is uh, the chart that has all the examples of biblical marriage. I always get a kick out of people talking about, we need to get to biblical marriage. What type of biblical marriage are you thinking of, right? Are you thinking of the one where the wife is the property of the male? Or the, the, the mar biblical marriage where the, the wife has to marry the, the, the brother of a dead spouse so that the lineage can be continued? Or are you thinking of the biblical marriage where you have multiple wives or multiple wives and multiple concubines or one wife and one concubine or one wife and, and servants? I mean, what, which biblical marriage do you want to you want to lean on, right? The, there are plenty of examples in Scripture where biblical marriage has really has nothing to do with what uh, God lays out at the very beginning in Genesis. The, the father shall leave the, the parents and cleave to the wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And it has nothing to do with what Paul is describing in his letter to the church at Ephesus of mutual submission to each other. So let us be clear up front uh, about, especially with this commandment, <clears throat> because it's an amazing example of it, that the Ten Commandments are the beginning of the law, they're the beginning uh, of the, God's guidance on how to live, but there is a sense in which they are aspirational. We aren't there yet, right? That we, are, we are striving to be a culture that embodies the Ten Commandments just as they were in the Old Testament, and we fail just as much as they did then. Now, this particular commandment does get us pretty close to home, right? Because this, this set of commandments, the latter set of the commandments, uh, focus on loving the neighbor. And we started with loving your first neighbors, your parents. Then the very basic part of loving your neighbor, which is don't kill them. That's a good way to start loving your neighbor. Don't, don't knock them off. And, and now we turn to loving your closest neighbor, the one you wake up and look over at in bed. That's your neighbor too, right? And so it's interesting to note that um, the closeness of this relationship, like the very nature of marriage is that you can be married to one person and that's it. You can't make that commitment to other pe another person because you can be married to one person. And um, it, it, it echoes the relationship between God and God's people. You can have one God. You can't have others. You can't make that same commitment to others. And so <clears throat> throughout Scripture, when... Uh, God is talking about uh, turning to other gods. The, the, the language used is of adultery, right? It's that same breaking of a covenant that's supposed to only be to one person. And there's a <coughs> there are warnings about this in, in the Old Testament law. Exodus 34, You shall not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, for they will prostitute themselves, remembering what word to hear there not prostitute, that when you prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to their gods, someone among them will invite you and you'll get sucked in and you'll be committing this, this prostitution, this infidelity. And then it does happen. The prophets again and again will point out you're turning to other gods. Jeremiah 13 is an example. I have seen your abominations, your adulteries and neighings, your lewd harlotries on the hills in the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! How long will it be before you are made clean? The uh, neighings is talking about an animal in heat. And going up on the hills, that's where you would have the sacred prostitutes of these other gods. And so this is eh, it's kind of a 
explicit. We, we're not going to spend much time on this, but I just want to note that this idea of idolatry and adultery are, are, are very closely tied in Scripture. Now to turn to adultery itself, there's a real concern that uh, as the people receive the Ten Commandments, they're going to be, begin building this culture. They have left slavery and they're going to the Promised Land and they have to choose what type of culture they will build. And as they go there, they have to choose to build a, cult, a culture that does not condone adultery. And, and there are some very good reasons to, to do this. Uh, some sort of negative reasons first, because they, they need to uh, avoid paternity issues. They need to keep the lineage clean because they, uh, when you're surrounded by all sides of, of other ethnic groups, other nations who would really love to pull you into their nation to sort of take you over culturally. Uh, you got to stay uh, committed to your people and your nation. And so marriage has to be kept secure so that everyone knows who's a Jew and who is not. Further, the marriage uh, has to be kept secure against adultery for economic reasons because children and women and the elderly will starve if the marriage breaks down and the family, the basic economic unit is not whole. Right? There's a very real sense that what happened behind closed doors could destroy the nation if it was not handled carefully. And this, got, this, this was taken so ter seriously that if two people went for a roll in the hay and they weren't betrothed to someone else, shotgun marriage, right? That shotgun wouldn't be invented for centuries, doesn't matter. Shotgun marriage, got to get married. You, you slept with them, that's it. Paternity cannot be in question. Go get married. Much of that concern about how adultery could destroy the very fabric of a community and a nation has passed, which may or may not be a good thing. That's a discussion for another time. But what still remains is a concern that sexual practice outside, sexuality practice outside the bounds of marriage is going to be deceitful. Right? It is just going to be inherently deceitful because when two people share the most intimate part of their bodies, but they're not sharing everything else, they're holding themselves back. They're sharing everything about them physically, but you're not sharing what is most fragile about you in other ways, right? You're not made, you don't have a long-term commitment such that you can share um, what it is that makes you tick, what it is that matters to you, what the hopes and the dreams, what, what, is, what is the things that you don't show to anyone else, right? This is part of the, um, the verb in the Bible often used to talk about sex, often euphemistically, is this idea of to know, to know someone. Right? And, and so sex, receiving the gift of sexuality and practicing it with another is to be known by that other person. And if you don't know them and you, can't, you don't have a relationship that you can trust them with all of you, which takes a lifelong commitment to, to be willing to share what is most broken about you, well, then you're hiding yourself. And what ends up happening is people will say, I love you, but what they will often mean is, I love me and want to use you. Right? That's what I love you can turn into. I love me, but I want to use you to feel good, to feel accepted, or whatever. But uh, marriage outside, or sex outside of the bounds of marriage just it, it's, it's inherently doesn't lead to the telling of truth. And so to, to this, we as Christians say that we have a better way, something more fulfilling, something healthier, something far more true and beautiful. And we call it monogamy and fidelity. We call it marriage. Something which we protect as we avoid adultery with others. Remembering the commandment always has two sides. Do this, don't do that. And so as we don't commit adultery, we are protecting each other's marriages, building a community that values marriage. And the way of life that, that marriage builds up is, is a way of life that we choose. We choose marriage daily, right? We choose, when you're up front and someone asks you, uh, do they ask you, do you love this person? Or will you love this person? Right. If, you ask, if they ask, do you love this person? The answer is always going to be, yay, warm and fuzzies, right? You know, will you love this person is different. That's what marriage is based on. Will you choose to love this person again and again and again as a lifelong of monogamy, of fidelity, of commitment, right? Do you love this person doesn't get you out of bed at 12, 12 this morning when I looked over at the clock and heard Olivia puking. Right? That, that actually happened a couple hours ago. I mean, will you love this person is what gets me to jump out of bed and go empty the <sighs> long night. Uh, it, and that's, that's will you love. And, and will you love this person? And when people continually choose, yes, I will love this person for 30 years, for 50 years, for 70 years. You know the couples that you look at have been married forever? 
And they're just beautiful because they have learned to serve and to forgive and to submit to each other. They have, they have become beautiful in that they have followed Jesus together. And they have, followed that they, have, they have done something that is made possible by safeguarding each other's marriages against adultery and building up a way of life that, that supports following Jesus together. We look at marriage like this. And what we see is marriage is the framework for the building of saints. It's the framework for transforming people day by day to be more like Jesus. It's the framework in which we can be honest. Right? I can trust anyone with the best in me, but who can I trust with the worst in me? Who can I trust to show you what is most fragile and broken and tender? It's the person who's promised to be there tomorrow, no matter what. Right? So marriage is the context in which, the framework in which we can learn to tell the truth in a society that lies way too easily and way too often. Marriage is the framework where we can learn to say I love you and really mean it and get over saying I love me and want to use you to feel good. And, and then that framework where we have learned to really love, to love the other person for that person becomes a safe place to raise children. Because if you look at a child and say, I love you, and what you really mean is I love me but want to use you, you know what children aren't? They ain't useful. Right? They're wonderful, they're great, there are gifts from God, but they ain't useful. <laughs> so marriage is a safe place to be able to learn to say, I love you, and then to have children who need the stability, the security, the safety of parents who will be there together for a lifetime. Marriage is the framework in which the gift of our sexuality can be received in having sex, which sounds a lot like having a steak or whatever, can be transformed to making love. It's a far more powerful phrase, right? Have sex. No. Make love. Far, far more potent thing to talk about. We, as, we make our commitment to this way of life, to this framework of receiving our sexuality, and we do it publicly, and it is ever more important that we do so, because we live in a culture that is simultaneously confused, and that it is, is confused and that it is simultaneously way too casual and way too serious about sexuality. It's casual in that sex has been reduced to hooking up. And uh, have you ever heard the wonderful phrase, friends with benefits? I came across that phrase in college. You want to guess what the benefits are? Blah. Right? Friends with benefits. The assumption is that as long as it's consensual and no one gets hurt, of course you should go jump in the sack and go for it and pick your euphemism here. But uh, and that is undergirded by the belief that you're not hurt if you don't realize you're being hurt. And as Christians, we say that, that sex is something like tape. Get a piece of tape here. Sex does a great job of sticking two people together, right? It sticks two people really well together. But if you go have sex with another, you take, take off, you go have sex with another person, you know what happens? Tape stops being as sticky, doesn't it? And you stick, another, you stick to another person, not as much hair comes off this time. And what happens is, if you practice something other than monogamous fidelity, you damage your ability to be in a lifelong monogamous f relationship, right? You don't think you're hurting yourself, but if you have sex with a whole bunch of people, the, st the tape stops being sticky, because sex is meant to bind us together. Well, you can abuse it. Tape, tape stops being sticky, and you are harming yourself because it harms your ability to lead this lifelong, committed, monogamous relationship. Our culture takes sex too casually, it's not seeing how it can damage us to be promiscuous, but our culture also takes sex too seriously in, in the sense that uh, if people aren't sexually active, it's somehow they're seen as somehow less, they're not a real man, is the phrase I've heard before. Or if you question a person's sexuality at all, you're questioning the essence of that person, that there's nothing more to that person than their sexual. Yeah. Our response to that is to say that we know a better way, we practice a better way, we strive for a better way that's not obsessed about sexuality but receives it as a gift. For this church says that uh, everyone's born single, right? Anyone here born with a wedding ring on? Nope, right? It, it wouldn't fit for very long. Everyone is born single and that's okay. 
It is okay to be single. The burden of proof, is, in fact, is on the people who want to get married. Because the question ends up being, will getting married help you follow Jesus together better? And if not, you shouldn't get married. Being single is okay. Being married has the burden of proof. Right? The church is a place where we are a family bound together in baptism, where every adult is a parent to every child, and so that those who are married can lean on the rest of the family for help in staying married, and those who are single can accept that they may be married at some point or not, and they can practice being family here together, practicing chastity during that time, so that if and when they are married, this tape is still sticky, so to speak. And those who are older and married, or those who are widows, can assist those who are younger in learning how to stay married. And this is something I actually do intend to ask about. At so, next time someone comes to me to ask for premarital counseling and wants to get married, how dare I try to give them premarital counseling? Some of you have been married longer than I've been alive. I need your help, right? Next time someone comes to me for premarital counseling, I'm turning to the church. I'm going to ask one of y'all to give premarital counseling because y'all have a lot more practice at being married thing than I do. I'm still figuring it out. All right? So, yeah. Now, how do we protect marriages? That, that's our, what's our method? That, that's kind of where we're going to land. What, what's the, practically, what do we do to protect marriages, to protect our neighbor's marriages, to not uh, go, fall into the, the sin of adultery? I have some training on this, and, and it's interesting, because every four years, Methodist pastors have to go to, uh, it's called boundaries training, and a bunch of Methodist pastors from like a quarter of the state get together, and we have a full day of training on pre preserving boundaries, healthy relationships, and that's what they call it, I'll admit, when I put it on my calendar, I call it keep your pants on training. Because that seems to be the thrust of most of it. Keep your pants on. If you have any question about whether your pants should be off, the answer is no. Do not take your pants off. And uh, I was in the middle of one of these meetings, and we're sitting in a, a small, sitting in small groups around tables because we're going to have discussion about this. And I'm sitting there with four or five other pastors. It was even more awkward than giving the sermon. Uh, and uh, we got to this point where everyone were going to have this little chat about not falling into the sin of adultery, and everyone had sort of chimed in. The other four or five pastors, and it was kind of my turn, and so I got to say something. I don't know these people. Awkward. So this is what I say. I'm not all that worried about adultery, because I think my wife's really attractive. <laughs> and they all stared at me, and they didn't say anything. And for years I've been thinking, that might have been the stupidest thing I've said in a long time, which would be saying something. But... Um, I was looking at, at the scripture this week and looking at, at the advice to, to married folk, and, and I found something interesting. I hadn't put this together yet. Uh, Proverbs 5 to 7 is advice on how to stay married. And, and, and here's Proverbs 5. It says, Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Let your fountain be blessed. They're not talking about a fountain. And rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. May her breasts satisfy you at all times. May you be intoxicated always by her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, by another woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Now, again, Bible translators are weenies. Intoxicated? Intoxicated is DWI, driving while intoxicated. That's not really the best translation. It's drunk. Be drunk on your wife. Be so wrapped up in your wife that you can't think of drinking from any other well. Just think that your wife is the hottest thing on the block, wrapped up in her. She is as good as it's going to get. You just focus on how beautiful your wife is. And you know who you're not going to pay attention to? Anyone else? Right? Turns out it's very biblical. I think my wife's attractive. I'm not worried about adultery. i got Olivia. Right? But you, go, you go read the Song of Songs, um, and I say got Olivia, that is not possessive. Don't, whew, I hope she doesn't watch this. Uh, <laughs> you go read the Song of Songs, and it, it's this deeply personal set of love letters between two people who are in love and who are married and are enraptured with each other. And it is, it, it's hard to read because it's so intensely private, but it is given to us as a gift to show us how marriage works to be wrapped up in each other. Right? It's intensely private, it, it, but it's showing us something that we, we need to see. Now, no, no discussion of adultery by Christians can end uh, without telling the story of Jesus, who confronted with a question of adultery in John 8, he, he responds. Uh, Jesus is confronted by this woman who has committed adultery, and, and he is told, okay, 
she needs to be stoned now. Let's stone her, Jesus. And he says, he who is without sin, uh, throw the first stone. No one throws a stone. And uh, Jesus looks at her and says, um, no one has condemned you, and uh, neither do I. Go forth and sin no more. And she goes, even in adultery, even when there is this type of failure, there is forgiveness. There is grace. A new beginning can be made. A different future can be found. No person is as bad as their worst sin. No person is as bad as their worst sin. There is always a new start that is possible. There is always an ability to recommit to the lifelong fidelity from that day forward. And this lifelong fidelity is made possible in the church as we seek to protect each other's marriages. Uh, for those of us who are called to marriage, we seek to, to seek to be wrapped up in, in our spouse. For those who are single, we, we seek to preserve the, a way of life that keeps us ready to be married, if that is to be. Um, for those who, are, who have been married a long time, we, we seek to be able to share that wisdom with those who, who need to learn. It, doing all these things so that day by day, we might experience marriage as a means of grace, a way in which we become more graceful, more beautiful, and more the person God calls us to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.